All right, welcome everyone to the IFAM seminar series held each Thursday. My name is Brissel Grisel Robles Schrader. I'm the Community Engagement Director with the Program in Public Health within the Center for Education and Health Sciences in IFAM. I'm excited to introduce today's speaker because his work aligns with providing culturally and linguistically appropriate services in healthcare settings and in health research, which is a passion of mine. Um, so with that, let me introduce you to our speaker, Matt Ginsberg Jekyll. He's the Associate Director of Global Patient Services at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. He is a co-investigator of a Coleman Foundation project titled Measuring and Enhancing the Reliability of Interpreter-Mediated Aphasia Assessments. Matt has worked at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab for over a decade as a Spanish interpreter, as well as an administrator within an international department that helps facilitate access to rehabilitation for hundreds of patients across dozens of countries around the world every year. Matt received his MA in Translation and Interpreting Studies from the University of Illinois Center for Translation Studies and a BA from the University of Chicago in Latin American History. Over the last decade, Matt has also trained hundreds of Chicago healthcare interpreters for both language access agencies and community colleges. He recently completed a project he designed and obtain funding for via Shirley Ryan Ability Lab collaboration with the Coleman Foundation to better understand and improve the services received by patients with communication disorders who have limited English proficiency and access speech therapy through an interpreter. That project, again titled Measuring and Enhancing the Reliability of Interpreter Mediated Aphasia Assessments, was the first study of its kind to understand the impact of interpreting on the assessment of the patients with aphasia, as well as implementing and measuring the effect of an intervention in order to shift that role of the interpreter and improve the reliability of those assessments. So Matt will leave 10 minutes at the end of this session for Q&A. Audience, please use the Q&A option, not the chat, to post questions. That's what we'll review at the end. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass this over to Matt. Take it away. Thank you so much, Grisel. Um, and really thank you to the Center for Education and Health Sciences and to the Institute for Public Health and Medicine. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you, Adela, as well, and all of the staff of both of your amazing institutes. Um, it's exciting for me to be here. It's always strange to give a talk when I can't actually see the faces of my audience. Um, so I won't have the benefit of knowing when my jokes don't land well, and I'm just going to assume that you're all out there in cyberspace laughing. Um, but I did want to get some sense of who's out there. So if I could just launch the first poll and just see who do we have here. Um, you can check multiple, as I know some of you might be, for example, a physician and a researcher or an allied health professional and a researcher. Um, so go ahead and answer the poll. Just give it a few more seconds. And the reason I like to start this way is coming from a language profession, the first thing that we think about is who is our audience. And that's a lot about what I'm going to be talking about today is the importance of understanding who you're communicating with, um, what perspectives they might be coming from. So we can go ahead and close the poll if everyone's had a chance. To and then there we go. So great, a lot of researchers, and I hope to leave you with some practical tips that might help you with language access and research. I'm also gonna uh, be focusing some on the conceptual framework I come from. Great to see that we have some allied health professionals, um, a good chunk of administrators and staff and mental health and other. All right, thank you everybody for that. Um, before I get started, I just wanna let you know I don't have anything to disclose, no financial interest to disclose. Um, and what I am going to speak on today is drawing from my professional experience, both within the hospital I work at, but also outside of it, and the perspectives offered within our, my own perspectives. Um, so let's get to it. Oh, if I can advance the slide. There we go. So I just wanted to start out with one of my favorite quotes uh, when we talk about translation. I didn't put an option on there for interpreters or translators because I already knew that all of you are translators or interpreters. 
um, according to Octavio Paz, one of the Nobel laureates for literature and, and from Mexico's definition, which is when we learn to speak, we learn to translate, that just the very act of trying to channel what we feel, what we're experiencing in the world, um, the complex interactions we have with people every day into words, into this condensed framework of the word or the sentence is an act of translation itself. So you're all already translators, but I hope to deepen your experience a little today. Um, and I just wanna go over some of the concepts that I'm gonna to try to cover. Um, oops. The first one is, I just wanna situate this idea of language access conceptually within a, a justice framework um, and also give you some tips for implementing it practically within research projects as well as within the clinical environment. Um, I'm going to talk about interpreters, not just as a black box that one language goes into and another comes out of, but actually as facilitators, visible facilitators as a relationship across language and culture, kind of pushing against the traditional notion of an interpreter as an invisible entity. Um, and talk about equivalence and try to complicate our understanding of that, right? How every interpreter, the thing that gives us the most, uh, annoys us the most within any session is when people say, well, just say exactly what I said, right? Equivalence is situational, it's complicated, and it requires collaboration to navigate. And that's where I'm gonna to touch a little bit on my own research, uh, exploring exactly that. Um, and then overall, just moving us from a paradigm of thinking about language access as a barrier, like, oh, I could have all these participants if I didn't have this language barrier, um, in a way that really tends to unknowingly center English and center the dominant language and reproduce power dynamics that assume um, that who those who lack uh, are those uh, who speak the non-English language versus um, moving us towards a conception of interpreting as being about the value of voice and being something where we're really able to overcome um, uh, a series of complicated power dynamics. So this will make more sense, hopefully, as I get into things. But I first wanted to just talk about research generally, and this is not going to be new information given the abundance of researchers on this call to you. So I'll go through it quickly. But as we all know, the whole reason we have to go through our city training, uh, the whole reason for the emergence of a bioethics field in the first place is because research has not always had um, the best relationship to communities, particularly to communities of color in this country um, and to communities on the other end of a power dynamic in general throughout the world. So. Um, I want to start off just recognizing that and recognizing the harm that that stems from. Um, and then fortunately, not just a historical harm, but one that's ongoing and continues to find resonance even in our highest halls of power, I feel obliged to say. Um, and of course, there have been important efforts to mitigate that harm. That's why, why we have informed consent. That's why we have the, again, the field of bioethics. That's why we have the Belmont Report and the findings around its justice principle, for example. And it's out of that that we see the emergence of talking about the need to broaden and think about access uh, to effective communication, not just intralingual, but uh, interlingual, right? Um, and that moved us over time into a framework of equity and inclusion, what supports are actually needed to reduce barriers to participation. Um, and I want to in my presentation won't fully go here, but I think that thinking more deeply about interpreting and what it looks like, hopefully moves us towards a, a fourth level, which is a justice or protagonism framework and rethinking what are the research priorities? How do we decide what gets studied in the first place? Cultivating leadership from the communities that have been traditionally both harmed and excluded within our research teams um, and certainly within our participants. Um, so, Beyond that sort of framework, of course, there is this just scale of linguistic diversity in this country, and this is obviously not completely updated. This goes through just 2013. I will have good data when the census finally wraps up and we get the results of it. But you can see, and it's no surprise to anybody that lives in Chicago, we are an incredibly linguistically diverse country, um, somewhere on the scale of 25 million plus people that identify as having limited English proficiency, the majority of which are foreign born, but also a good a uh, number of people who are native born and still have um, identify as having limited English proficiency. Um, beyond the need, there's also, of course, legal and regulatory considerations that make it important for us to prioritize language access. So the common rule says that information given to research subjects during informed consent shall be in a language understandable to the subject or the representative. Um, there is, of course, the justice principle I referenced earlier from the Belmont report saying that we can't exclude subjects based on anything other than scientific or ethical criteria. So that includes language. We cannot exclude 
uh, based on language. We need to be thinking about language access. Um, there's federal regulations that require the selection of research subjects be equitable as well. Um, and the, I'll just say to the clinicians on the call who aren't researchers, there's parallels to all of this, of course, within the clinical world, uh, more under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act um, and regulations governing those who uh, receive government payers, as well as, of course, the Joint Commission. Um, and then even if we didn't have anything restricting us in, about it, even if we weren't aware necessarily of, of the scale of the issue, there's a cost to not having interpreters and not thinking through language access. Um, there's, uh, and oftentimes what people end up doing is they think because they have a simplistic notion of language access and just a black box that one language goes into another or a Google Translate, which we'll get into in a little bit, right? They'll pull in a family member or a Google Translate or a staff member who happens to be bilingual which can often lead to breakdowns in trust, erroneous assessments, so introducing error into your projects, inefficiencies or repetitions of tests that may have already been done and there's confusion about because of the communication barriers, uh, worse protocol compliance by subjects, and also then again on the clinical side, worse treatment compliance by patients, largely due to the lack of trust, but also confusion as well. And even there have been numerous lawsuits uh, based on people who did not have the supports they needed to understand what they were doing and what the potential side effects were. Um, so in order to make this happen, this is the first section of practical tips. Uh, you need to, it starts from when you plan your project. I usually get calls from, uh, my, from fellow researchers or staff members here at the hospital uh, after they've gotten their first subject signing up who's requesting an interpreter, which is way too late in the game. Um, it's better than nothing, but it's, it's way too late in the game. We need to be building this into our budgets and planning for it, budgeting for it, recruiting our teams based on this. So just to give you a sense of, and this is very broad, a sense of what it can cost when you're budgeting uh, for an independent interpreter agency it could be around 50 or $60 an hour, 30 for most hospitals is what their in-house staff uh, will end up being charging for your cost centers. That varies based on what language, how rare the language is, um, but to give you a general sense. Also, including material translation in your budget. So uh, the distinction between, for those who might be wondering, an interpreter and a translator, interpreters do spoken word in the moment, um, and translators do the written word. So you, if you need to translate those consents, if you need to translate any of the materials from your research protocols, you can budget around 15 cents a word for more commonly spoken languages, probably about twice that for less commonly spoken languages or for highly technical content. Um, and then of course, a huge thing is not having to interpret every single interaction, right? Having people from the communities uh, that you think that you'll be recruiting from as part of your research team, taking cultural and linguistic diversity into account when you're choosing members of the team. And then of course, and this is moving us towards that fourth point, the justice or protagonism framework, intentionally recruiting, cultivating, and supporting the development of researchers who speak languages other than English in our context. So those are some of the planning considerations. I'm gonna assume you've all done that. We're here, you've got your first subject coming in, you've got this interpreter walking in the door, everything's simple, right? Not so much. So I wanna complicate uh, a little bit some of our understandings of what an interpreter does. Um, beyond the norm of an uh, invisible interpreter. So there's actually four roles that we talk about when I train interpreters that an interpreter takes on. Um, the first one and the one that we mostly think of is that message converter where you're taking a message from one language into another. Simple enough, right? Even that is highly complicated. Um, and I'll return to this at the end of my research, at the end of my presentation when I talk about my research, but just to give you a sense right now, the act of converting a message from one language and cultural context into another requires an interpreter to listen to what's being communicated, abstract the core meaning out of and the nuance within that meaning from the phrasing, from the syntax, recognize any potential ambiguities that might interfere with your understanding of the message and ability to render it correctly. And those are ambiguities in both source and target language, by the way. Uh, and then try to render that same meaning while navigating a cultural and linguistic nuance and conveying subtleties like tone, volume, hesitancy into another language, because those are a huge part of how and what we communicate without adding, omitting any content. And at the same time, be looking at the subject or the patient or the doctor or the researcher, looking to see whether they're understanding as you're communicating this while listening because people tend to cut us off before we're done interpreting the last phrase listening for the next utterance so all of that is happening at once just within the first role of interpreting um, 
one key to this is when interpreters are in this role, ideally they should be speaking in the first person. So that's another thing that confuses people the first time you're working with an interpreter is uh, when you say to the patient, how are you doing today? The interpreter shouldn't be saying, the doctor wants to know or the researcher wants to know how you're doing today. They should be phrasing it as, how are you doing today? If the, uh, if the patient says, or the subject says, um, oh, I don't feel so well. They're not gonna say he doesn't or she doesn't feel so well. They're gonna say, I don't feel so well, right? We're trying to just be as straight, as close as possible transmission channel for that message. Um, but there's other roles. So the second one is a message clarifier. Uh, and ideally this is not an interpreter actually clarifying, like let me explain what they meant to say, but this is when interpreters need to ask for clarification and facilitate additional communication about what's actually being communicated. So that could happen if an interpreter doesn't understand something, uh, if they couldn't hear something, if there's two ways to say something and they need further clarity before deciding which way to render it, if they're concerned that a misunderstanding might be arising, if they don't know a word themselves. Um, and then when they're asking for clarification, you know, one of the things that I, I like to point out to folks that you may or may not recognize is interpreters are always suspect. Uh, and this goes back to the to the beginning of time in the royal courts when the first encounters between people who are linguistically distinct uh, took place. The interpreters are always been perceived. There's a phrase in Italian, traduttori traditore, which is translator traitor, essentially, right? They're always perceived by the, by one grouping as uh, being having access to the culture and therefore somewhat familiar and and trustable, but yet being part of an outside institution and suspect. And from the folks within that institution, suspect because of that connection to the outside culture or language. So in order to mediate some of that effect, interpreters, when they do use their own voice to ask for clarification, need to be very cognizant of avoiding the perception of a side conversation about somebody that's not including that person within that conversation. So uh, that's why we would leave first person, like let, a, let people know I, the interpreter, need to ask for clarification, identifying themselves as a speaker, telling whoever was not just speaking what we're doing so that it, we don't even for a split second create the perception of a side conversation um, and be transparent about what we've asked and what, was, what the answers were. Um, that an extension of that role that can be additionally fraught is around cultural brokering or cultural clarifying, right? Uh, the example I have here is a real example that one of my colleagues here at the hospital raised, which is a perfect one, was a patient who showed up here and had a bad headache uh, from, uh, she was of Mexican descent, and asked for some alcohol and a washcloth. And the nurse thought she was asking for a drink and that it was uh, her cognitive impairment leaning for her to make an inappropriate request. And the interpreter needed to clarify that actually putting some rubbing alcohol on a washcloth is a common home remedy for uh, for headaches uh, in many cultures, actually. Um, so that's an example when an interpreter might need to step in and ideally facilitate a conversation where people are explaining their own cultural differences to each other in order to arrive at understanding where there's been breakdown. So this involves identifying those potentially culturally based misunderstandings, deciding whether to intervene or not. There's always a risk to intervening in the sense of undermining autonomy, stereotyping, um, speaking for somebody, uh, undermining the direct communication flow between a patient and provider or a researcher and patient or subject. Again, avoiding stereotyping, um, thinking about how do I, will this intervention actually strengthen the relationship? And finally, in extreme circumstances, an interpreter can be their own voice and actually be an advocate if the subject's immediate health, safety, or dignity is at risk. So. Those are the four roles, just to review. Interpreters need to know how to convert messages, clarify messages, facilitate conversations about cultural content to clarify it when needed, and advocate. And overall, the way I would describe it then is that what we are is we're not, again, a box that language flows in and out of. We're really facilitators of a relationship and a relationship that is crossing linguistic and cultural difference. Um, so, now I want to talk about why does it matter for facilitators of a relationship, um, you know, you just need the subject to come in, do your protocol, move on, right? Why does the relationship actually matter? Um, so first of all, and I'm sure many in this audience would be aware of the studies that have emphasized the importance of the clinician-patient relationship and researcher-patient relationship. 
Um, there was one study that I love the title of, Can Empathy Be As Effective as an Aspen? The patient-clinician relationship affects medical outcomes that actually show that it's not just that we feel better when we're connected to the people uh, that, are, that are working with us in a healthcare setting. Uh, it actually has physiological impacts. It reduces blood pressure and it has oh, and a number of other uh, results that were found in the study. So the quote I pulled out is, general empathy in a meaningful patient-clinician relationship appears to improve the patient's well-being both emotionally and now physically. So an idea of the subject-researcher relationship to apply this to that, again, it can impact compliance with our protocols, the reporting of impertinent information. If I don't trust you, I may or may not volunteer information that could compromise your data. Um, it can impact the researcher perception. You might not pick up on things. How are you going to pick up on something with someone you have no relationship with? Um, performance during study-related tasks, all of that can be impacted by that relationship. So how can you help us as interpreters to facilitate that relationship? The first thing, and this is basically the same exact logic we apply with regards to disability rights and disability ethics, right, is that Patients, even if they don't, or subjects, even if they don't speak your language, they are still autonomous human beings. And it's not nice to talk about somebody in the third person as if they're not there and never look at them, right? So uh, just because they don't speak your language doesn't mean you should be talking to the interpreter instead of them. Interpreters hopefully will remind you to, but it helps when researchers and clinicians know to speak directly to the patient and talk to them in the first person. Um, another thing is to be aware of the communication flow. Um, Try not to be too choppy with what you're saying, like I'm doing now, because it's really difficult. Remember that first slide where I talked about extracting the meaning and thinking about its context and rendering it? It's really difficult to do that if you haven't got to the meaning part yet, right? So don't think you have to stop every two words, because words by themselves don't work if they're not in a sentence. Hopefully needly to say, needless to say. Um, aim for a complete sentence, but of course, a complete sentence that's also not full of clauses, aka not the kind of complete sentences I've probably mostly been delivering during this presentation. Um, single idea sentences um, and, and moving on in a logical sequence as you go, being as natural as possible. And when an interpreter starts interpreting, pause and wait. Um, paying attention from signs from the interpreter to stop. Um, it could be hand signals, it could be us raising our voice and jumping in to start interpreting. And finally, last thing is just, I know it's challenging and might be counterintuitive because we're not used to communicating through an interpreter, but try to be yourself. A relationship can't form with yourself if you're not being yourself, right? Um, so we, you want to expect everything to be interpreted. A huge part of how we build rapport with people is the jokes, the small talk. That's essential to how relationships form. So if you decide, oh, I'm worried about whether this will translate well, quote unquote, and exclude something you would normally say to another patient, you're, uh, you're preventing, you're eliminating an opportunity for a deepening of that relationship. And it, it might not translate well. M much of humor doesn't. But, th but that in and of itself can be humorous and can be the basis of beginning to break down some of these barriers. So uh, expect that um, to be interpreted. Expect everything to be interpreted. Again, because of that trust factor that I mentioned and the perception of interpreters is not always trustworthy. Um, expect even passing comments you might make to a nearby colleague to be interpreted. Um, and likewise, you should expect, and if necessary, sometimes have to ask an interpreter to interpret the side conversations by a patient or a subject. Um, a lot of times, very valuable information comes out in those side conversations that may be relevant to your protocols. Be curious and ask questions. The best way to get to know somebody is to ask questions, and you have the blessing of having an interpreter there to help facilitate those exchanges. Um, and finally, always, and this is this should go without saying because it's part of a clinical and research practice in general, but check for understanding, especially when you are working with an interpreter. So check to make sure you understood the patient or the subject and check to make sure they understood you. Try to, and this will jump into this more in depth with when I talk about my research in a moment here, but try to explain the communication goals, that the way we interpret is going to actually change based on the setting and what you're trying to do with the communication. Um, so ideally, you have time both before the session to talk to the interpreter about what you're trying to understand or get out, um, and then also to debrief afterwards. Provide a space for the interpreter to always introduce themselves and ex explain their key interpreting expectations, which tend to be, at a bare minimum, reinforcing that they're going to be interpreting everything 
and for people to speak directly to each other because it's also often not natural for a, a subject or a patient who doesn't speak English to look and talk directly um, at a clinician or a researcher who doesn't speak the language. Um, try to avoid overusing acronyms and spell them out and slowly, not just running through them. Uh, and again, to debrief with the interpreter after the session when possible to help to improve that relationship and communication. So just gonna, I'm gonna run through these because I wanna have time for talking about my research as well as talking about, um, as well as answering your questions, but just to repeat the key takeaways here, the practical advice for working with interpreters, make it part of your budget, part of your proposal, recruit, cultivate, and try to support linguistically and culturally diverse researchers within your teams. When you're then working with an interpreter, look and speak directly to the subject and speak to them in the first person. Try to speak in complete thoughts. Try to control the length of your utterances while also speaking in complete thoughts. Don't talk over interpreters. Expect everything to be interpreted. Check for understanding. Explain your goals. Provide space for an introduction. Avoid acronyms and jargon and debrief at the end. All right, so there's your checklist. Uh, this will be uploaded to YouTube later if you're not taking quick notes or screen shares. Um, all right, so now that I'm gonna get into the nerdy part, the part that uh, excites me, which is complicating our notion of, of equivalence. Um, I can't, if I had a dime for every time that somebody told me just say exactly what I say, I'd be a rich man by now. Um, so. The problem is, it would be great to be able to say just what you said, uh, but there is not one equivalence. Um, and it's just a cute way to portray that concept. You'll have to phrase it another way. They have no word for fetch, right? It's not, and it's not just a question of not having a, a, the same word or same concept uh, across cultures, right? It's also a question of, your again, your communication goals within the environment. So here's some of the things to problematize uh, this concept of interpreting exactly what I say. There's no such thing as a completely accurate rendition from one language into another. We're inherently changing, right? We're just at a basic, obvious level. We're speaking in another language. We're changing the words. I'm not saying your same words or you wouldn't need me. I wouldn't be here. Um, and what accuracy means, it's highly dependent on the context, the purpose, the content, and the cultural backgrounds. And I'm going to give examples in a moment that will hopefully make this uh, make more sense. <clears throat> so within healthcare, what's the purpose of the exchange? Are you trying to understand how a patient is speaking? Are you trying to understand their emotional state? Uh, or are you trying to get them to comply with a protocol uh, to carry out a certain task? Is it a practical level or is it a conceptual level? What's, what's the purpose of that communication? Again, to, is it to understand? Is it to comply with treatment or protocol? Follow an instruction? Is it to get a sense of their personality and sociocultural background? Is it to evaluate their speech and their speech patterns for, uh, in particular here for speech language pathologists? Is it to build rapport? Um, is, you know, and interpreters are constantly having to think through what we call register. So how simple or technical the language is. It's gonna be very important to match the register, a high level register. Many research protocols are you, you know, we sit for hours trying to think of the exact words to elicit the exact response and make sure that we're not prejudicing the answers, right? So communicating with an interpreter about that is important. Um, the cultural nuance of the language. Um, and an ideal, ideally what an interpreter does when confusion does arise then is suggest possible sources of confusion, making themselves visible in a way that's, uh, that's not often thought of uh, as one of the roles of an interpreter. So our project, we looked at a specific case of, of this phenomena of a, of a clinical situation where um, oftentimes the normative goals of an interpreter, which is normally we are about conveying meanings, right, and getting uh, a listening treatment compliance, uh, are very different or need to be very different. Um, when you're working with a patient with, with a speech therapist, they're trying to understand, they're trying to use speech, not just to communicate about something, but to communicate about that speech. They're trying to understand not just the content of the speech, but the form of that speech. And so when we what we thought and what I knew from my experience intuitively was that this is a big problem and a big disconnect. And our surveys of, of speech therapists here at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab bore this out. Over 80% um, before we did the study said that they 
feel like they have an accurate picture of a patient's language skills when working with an interpreter, only rarely or sometimes. And meanwhile, the interpreter said only a third of them felt that they, the expectations of those speech language pathologists were on average very clear. Um, so to address that disconnect, we looked at a particular subset of patients. Um, we took two patients, one with a fluent and one with a non-fluent aphasia uh, communication disorder. We took eight Spanish interpreters with the least a year of experience. Oops, sorry. Um, half of the interpreters we randomized into a training group where we tried to train out of them their normative role. We tried to teach them about what is a speech there. And it was jointly led that training by myself and one of our, uh, one of our speech therapist researchers, uh, Edie Babbitt, Dr. Edie Babbitt, um, and tried to talk to them to under, help them understand what a speech therapist is looking for and what it means to pay attention to the form of speech uh, rather than, or at least in addition to the content of that speech. Um, half of them didn't get that training and both of them did two sessions, one before the training had taken place and one after with both of the same patients. Um, and then we analyzed a separate SLP and an interpreter analyzed all of those sessions and come up with a checklist of the errors that are introduced by the interpreting process itself um, and use that to analyze the videos and measure the effectiveness of the intervention. And I, our results aren't published yet. Hopefully they will be soon, but I can give you just a little preview of saying there was a dramatic difference between the control group and the other group. We were able to reduce the average amount of errors by about 40% with a two hour training to just shift the mindset of, of interpreters. And so the purpose here, of course, is I hope you do all read the study and look at it and find it interesting, but I think there's broader lessons to draw out here with regards to how much more complicated communication ex and exchanges are and how much more we need to think about the purposes of communication within our sessions. Um, so I want to give you an example from the study. This is a real example that came up. Uh, the speech therapist said, this is during a word repetition section of a standardized test, they said to repeat the word purple. And the interpreter said the, the word for purple in Spanish, morado, or one of the words. And this was the patient's attempt, okay? So you can see there on the screen, morado is, is what they're going for. They said, orodo, parado, o par, pardo, es como que es, cambió el color. So, uh, orodo is not a word, but you can see, of course, some, some phonological similarities with the word they're going for, drawing from both the English and the Spanish, potentially. And they said parado. Parado is a word. It means standing or stopped, okay? But I'm sure that you can tell looking at this on the screen that what's significant is not the semantic content of that word, the, the, the fact of it hap happening to mean something real in Spanish. Uh, what's potentially significant is the parallel there. So it ends with, it has very similar sounds to the word purple. Um, and then several attempts at it, and then pardo, which is another word, which is a, a less common, but also acceptable way of saying the word color brown, right? So they landed on a color uh, with some with some phonological similarities. And then said, es como que es cambio el color. And the interpreter sitting there with all this, what, what do I do with this? She said, uh, it's like the color changed. So she, es que, which is basically that last part of the sentence there. So ignored the initial utterance. And so you might think, oh, that interpreter, they, they sure messed up. I told them to interpret exactly what I said, or exactly what the patient said, right? But let's think a little bit deeper about what the interpreter might be thinking, drawing from what I talked about earlier about how much more complicated equivalence is um, than we might initially think. So maybe they're thinking, well, the speech therapist can easily tell that the patient's not saying morado, um, so that's the key information, not knowing that they need to know what they're doing during their attempts to say that word. Um, they might be thinking, well, it might be useful for me to explain that parado and pardo are actually real words uh, in Spanish, um, that pardo has some relation as far as being another color, but both, uh, but I don't know if that's my role. I'm, I've been trained from day one to be invisible and everyone's always telling me to be invisible and, and uh, to not go beyond the message uh, converter role because I might undermine that relationship and there's distrust, et cetera. And I don't, right? So maybe the, the paradigm of invisibility is limiting them in intervening in ways that could be helpful. Maybe they're just thinking, how do I create equivalence in English for these utterances? They're not, they're not actually real words. What's the, what does exactly the same thing mean? Do I say bo, bar, right? 
um, maybe they're thinking, well, pardo and parado, they are real words, but they're not the target word. So I'm not gonna interpret them. And maybe they're thinking actually at a very deep level, maybe they're thinking, you know, if I were to interpret parado as standing or stopped, then this is, let's just take that. If I were to interpret parado as standing or stopped, that I might mislead the speech therapist. This is a speech therapist trying to understand what's going on with this speech. And they might think that what's actually a phonological substitution that changing a, a, a difficulty with the sounds or, or a sound substitution is a semantic substitution that what's primarily taking place here is that is that they ask for purple and you're saying standing because remember this the speech therapist is blind uh, to much of this they're just hearing i said purple and then getting back from the patient via the interpreter standing right maybe they're thinking about if i do interpret everything i'm actually going to mislead um this the speech therapist <clears throat> I hope that gives you a, some sense. This is just one, one example of many. So what we encourage interpreters to do is to not be afraid to move beyond their role of message converter and not also assume that they could become suddenly experts overnight uh, in the kind of areas that are being produced by an aphasic patient, but to know when something, to know the importance of highlighting to the speech therapist or researcher um, when something doesn't sound right in order to allow an opportunity for further interrogation of that. So this is why I talk about equivalence as being something that's negotiated and collaborative and not something that's just automatic. Um, and doesn't want to go forward. Okay. So this gets at, uh, and I'm going to wrap it up quickly here so we can get to questions and answers, but this gets at some of the tensions that exist in the interpreter role um, to, again, sort of transition back to why is this relevant for projects that aren't about our very specific subject of aphasia assessments? So one is just to know that interpreters generally are mandated to be invisible, and that's actually impossible. We're, A, we're not actually invisible. We're here, we're physical, we're present. Uh, but B, uh, it's not actually useful for us to try to make ourselves invisible because it can oftentimes lead to the omission of, of uh, insight that would be useful for a researcher. Um, but then that leaves us with the question that because of the simplistic normative understanding of interpreters and of language and cultural difference, um, there's not a paradigm for what kind of visibility interpreters should have. Just in the limited ways that I outlined at the beginning when I went through the roles there is, but there's much more research and, and practice needed to get to an understanding of, okay, well then if you are going to become visibility visible, how do you do so in a way that supports the researcher or clinician goals, in a way that doesn't undermine the relationship, in a way that continues to prioritize the autonomy of both parties, right? important questions that need to be answered. Um, so I like to think of interpreters beyond just facilitators of relationship, we're the personification of the complexity of intercultural communication. Um, and that the issues that arise when we're thinking through the appropriate role of an interpreter are actually windows into the limitation of our own understanding of difference more broadly, right? It's actually a blessing in some ways. So again, moving us beyond the oh, language barrier and I hate having to communicate through an interpreter and what an obstacle and looking at actual, at, at having an interpreter as an opportunity to have a window into a deeper understanding of difference and the way it might impact uh, our research, might impact clinical treatment, might impact in general the, um, the relationship between the particular communities uh, who are speakers of the non-dominant language within a society. Um, and then finally, to think about translation uh, as a metaphor um, and, and music. And I'm going to, <coughs> there's, um, there's a, a famous piece that all, everybody in translation studies has to read at the beginning of any program that, uh, by Walter Benjamin, who's an old translator. And he said, he talked about it as far as music. He said, when a musician performs, who are, who's the performance for? Right? Do we understand a, a musical expression is primarily about reaching an audience in a particular way? Well, that's, that's problematic, right? Because then that, that's a limit on the creativity. Or do we think of it primarily as uh, being about a self-expression of somebody? Well, that's also problematic because then why, why performance? Why, why the community? Or do we think about that act of, of music and performance or any art making in general as revealing some higher truth that brings together different ways of understanding the world? And, um, and I'm not doing full justice to the essay, but that's what I like to think about with interpreting is, is we're actually given an opportunity um, to get a deeper insight into the nature of difference itself and ways it can make us maybe rethink the way we communicate even within our own languages.
And so I'll just leave it with this final thing. It's one of my favorite passages uh, from my, one of my favorite uh, authors, the Argentine author, uh, Jorge Luis Borges. And this is a short story. It's a, a fictional story um, about, uh, it's, it's a, about a supposed translator who's just passed away and he's rendering homage to his work. And he says, his greatest work of all is that, is that he did a translation of Quixote, Don Quixote de la Mancha. And but he did it exactly. He did it word for word, right? Uh, and you're wondering, what does he mean by word for word? And he said, and, and, and yet, despite the fact that he did it word for word, he made it a much better work. It's far more creative. And you're wondering, and you don't understand, what's he talking about? What does he mean by word for word? And how could it be better if he's doing it word for word? And then you finally get, this is at the very end of this short story. It's like in a fictional one. I'm just going to read it out. Um, it's a revelation to compare the Don Quixote of Pierre Menard with that of Miguel Cervantes. Cervantes, for example, wrote the following. Truth, whose mother is history, rival of time, depository of deeds, witness of the past, exemplar and advisor to the present, and the future's counselor. This catalog of attributes written in 17th century and written by the ingenious layman and Miguel de Cervantes, mere rhetorical praise of his Menard, on the other hand, writes, truth, whose mother is history, rival of time, depository of deeds, witness of the past, exemplar and advisor of the present, and the future's counselor. History, the mother of truth, the idea is staggering. Menard, a contemporary of William James, defines history not as delving into reality, but the very fount of that reality. And he goes on and on in praise, right? Despite us having just finally seen that he actually is saying that the same words were repeated word for word. The implication, of course, being that all, again, to return to that Sylvia Plaza I started with at the beginning, all communication is translation, that the same words mean different things in different time periods, in different contexts, to different people, to uh, under when there's different communication goals. Um, and so that's what I mean by complicating our notion of, of equivalence and by translation being a window into understanding difference much better. So with that, I will open it up to questions. There's just some of my references on the screen. I will stop sharing. Matt, thank you so much. And um, please give a virtual and real shout out and clap to Matt. Um, thank you so much for sharing recaps throughout your presentation. That's extremely helpful as we understand new concepts and then you continue to move to the next um, strategy. Um, all right, audience, it's your turn. As Matt said in his presentation, we want you to be curious. So I ask that everyone ask at least one question using the Q&A function on your screen. And I've already got a couple people who got us kicked off. So the first one is, you know, there's a lot of large healthcare organizations in the Chicagoland area that don't have language options on the website to access um, their website in a preferred language. So thinking about access to care, to individuals who speak a language other than English, how can we increase the accessibility of online informational materials? Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. You know, a really unfortunate part of the modern world is, um, every, and the combination of the modern world and the, uh, the existence of simplistic understandings of, of intercultural communication is that people think that it's that this great innovation is that I can just put a Google Translate button on my website and have different languages and that's going to produce access to the content without asking any of the questions about who are you reaching, what, um, what, are, what do they need to know. Um, and it can even be dangerous in some ways that people are starting to look for healthcare advice and getting that through a Google Translate that's going to have none of the nuance or complexity involved in thinking through audience and source and purpose of communication that I've just described to you. Now, I also understand, of course, working myself in administration at a hospital, the limitations, particularly in this time um, of pandemic with regard to budgets and finances, but I, you know, it goes back to prioritizing. I oftentimes talk about when I'm working with a, when I'm gonna, I do some conference interpreting, and when I'm working with somebody who's planning language access for a conference, uh, and they say, well, can't you cut the budget? Can't you cut the budget? And I said, you know, I don't think you would cut the budget for your microphones and speakers, right? Because if your microphone goes out and your speakers don't work, there's no point in having your conference, period. But the same thing is true if we're continuing to uh, deprioritize language access. So it requires investment. There's no two ways about it. Translation is not cheap. One way in the short term is to think through what's the key content that will be relevant. And this is part of that sort of you know, uh, language access is facilitation of a relationship rather than just, you know, uh, providing access to the content that we've predetermined. So working with communities that might be accessing that in 
those languages to identify what are priorities uh, for translation and having not the same exact versions of our websites, which might be ideal, but at the very least um, landing pages in the most commonly spoken languages in the communities that we serve uh, that have the, the core content translated by a professional translator with a professional proofreader um, is just invaluable and it requires us to prioritize it and budget for it. Matt, how has the role of the interpreter changed over the last few months with the increased prevalence of telehealth services? Yeah, so a lot, it's it's an interesting question. Um, I've been, at the first, at the beginning, I was very worried about the, uh, the ways in which telehealth and virtual platforms were going to compromise our ability to do that facilitation of a relationship. Um, However, I've seen some really promising things. Um, and, I mean, so I'll start with just saying at a very basic level, we can't do all the modes. I didn't talk about modes of interpreting, but there's different modes of interpreting. So there's consecutive interpreting where I say something and then it's interpreted and then they say something and then it's interpreted and there's simultaneous interpreting normally done with interpreters in a booth at a conference and everybody has headsets and they're listening to it at the same time. But in a healthcare setting, we would also sometimes do simultaneous uh, interpreting um, in particular situations, maybe for a patient education session with multiple people in the room and one non-English speaker who were sitting and whispering and simultaneous interpreting too. So simultaneous interpreting has become virtually impossible via telehealth, mostly because of the limitations of the platforms that many of our hospitals are using. Only Zoom uh, is, has created a modality, uh, the functionality for simultaneous interpreting, but there's still lots of bugs within it, like interpreters who like to work in pairs when we're doing simultaneous interpreting. Um, not being able to hear each other's interpreting and know how to change shifts and a number of other things that I can bore you to death with. Um, and on top of that, most of our telehealth platforms are not using Zoom. Um, we're using WebEx, for example, and there's just no way to do simultaneous interpreting for it. So it does force us into consecutive mode. Um, that said, I will say I've just seen, we had a really wonderful uh, remote second opinion we were doing with a family from Brazil recently. And I was just marveling at the way the Portuguese interpreter uh, was continuing to really convey the jokes and to get the sense of humor across and to intervene as necessary to clarify cultural content. So much of what I talked about is still possible via a telehealth platform. It's different and it's challenging. You know, I, those who have seen me interpret know that I use a lot of body language and I like to move around and, you know, it's part of how I communicate the spirit of the speaker. That's much more challenging and distracting, frankly, via telehealth. Um, but that's not to say that there's not other ways to accomplish that same dynamic. So I've been pleasantly surprised is my final answer. Do you see any difference in interpretation with an interpreter that has the same cultural background of the patient versus an interpreter that just knows the language but has limited knowledge of the patient's cultural background. Yes, absolutely. Um, however, that's a more complicated question than you might think at the outset, because there's also dangers of people who, uh, who know the culture assuming knowledge of the particular individual's interpretation of their culture. Culture is fluid and it's evolving and it's different across generations and regions. Um, and so I would say in general, the broad thing to say is that interpreters need to be trained uh, to constantly be pursuing and enriching their cultural knowledge, um, but also humility around that knowledge and to understand that their role is primarily about facilitating a conversation around culture where people can speak for themselves. That said, those who are not immersed in or from the, ideally from the culture of those that they're interpreting from uh, are going to be less likely to pick up on some of those instances where there is a need to jump in and facilitate that conversation. Um, so absolutely, there are problems uh, for both groups of interpreters, those who have learned the language uh, after the fact and those who are heritage speakers of the language. Um, but certainly heritage speakers have a huge advantage when it comes to uh, immersion within the culture of the people that they're interpreting for. I have a couple more questions. And then Matt, I would just ask if you can put your contact information in the chat box so that people can reach out to you um, offline. That would be really helpful. So the next person said, first, thank you so much. In addition to your presentation, can you provide further cultural competency resources? Sorry, I was putting my contact in the chat. That's my office number and my email address. Um, 
in addition to my presentation for the contra yeah, I mean, I would point you to the Center for Education and Health Services uh, on that. I don't know if you, if you have particular resources. There is a lot of stuff out there. There's also a lot of bad stuff out there. Um, you know, oftentimes the mandate for diversity training and whatnot has led to a very watered down conversation around culture. Um, and particularly I'm skeptical of those who take power out of the conversation. Um, those and you know don't are afraid to talk about the power dynamics in society around us that influence the way in which uh, culture plays itself out in language. Um, so that's what I would look for as you're sorting through those programs. I don't have a particular one to recommend, but I don't know if we said if you have something. Sure, I can jump in. I would just uh, recommend that everyone go to the Office of Minority Health website. Just actually Google class standards. So C L A S is in Sam standards. And what you're going to find is a series of standards that the Office of Minority Health um, suggests as you start to think about like providing culturally and linguistically appropriate services. And then there's a lot of references listed there. We could also share some references um, after this call. All right, so a couple more questions. The topic and your research are very interesting. Thank you. What advice would you give to health educators who are working cross-culturally, but not explicitly cross-linguistically? Yeah, um, I think that that's a really good point. I oftentimes think about you know the additional insight that having an interpreter there uh, provides and what happened, because obviously cross-cultural exchanges are not always cross-linguistic, right? And then there's nobody there to necessarily facilitate that part of things. And oftentimes the power dynamics that exist in society will prevent somebody who might speak the same language from surfacing uh, a disagreement or a misunderstanding that might be culturally rooted, um, thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm here as a subject or patient and it's not my role to raise this. Um, I guess that it really just starts at just asking questions um, and not being afraid to to ask about what you don't know. Building rapport um, is key. Trying to ask uh, people that you're working with themselves about their lives, about what's important to them, what's interesting, about values, having values conversations. Um, and yeah, and reaching and and reaching out to colleagues who might share some of the cultural background of those you are working with as well for any insights while taking into account, of course, the risks of stereotyping and generalizing. Um, and that's part of why the emphasis in the initial part of my presentation on intentionality with recruitment of who our, our research teams are. All right, thank you so much for an incredible presentation. Any suggestions for when the interpreter is only present via phone and is not seeing the nonverbals in the clinician patient conversation and the clinician feels nuances are being missed? Yeah, so good question. I would say um, the same applies with as with interpreters in other settings is don't be afraid to have conversations with that interpreter about what you're afraid might be missing. And not in a, you know, interpreters can get defensive, uh, of course. So not in a, are you sure they said that? Or are you missing this or that other? But, you know, I'm not sure I caught such and such. Uh, could you repeat this? Let me, repeating back what you understood and um, using that as an opportunity to check whether there's been any breakdowns in that communication chain. It is, of course, really challenging. Um, and the problem is not just the modality of phone interpreting. The problem, unfortunately, is also the labor conditions uh, within the interpreting industry. So oftentimes, uh, the agencies that provide phone interpreting are paying very low and not recruiting or promoting talent development. You know, people want, want to get out of that as soon as they can. And so you end up oftentimes with people with less experience. And there's also context problems um, with, with people who are just being zoomed in via phone to a million different settings with no ability to develop rapport. I do highly encourage, and I know this is obviously not possible in many settings, um, but one thing at the outset of the pandemic, we had always provided in-person interpreters for our in international patients, just feeling you, you've come 3,000 miles, you're far away from everything you know and are used to. Um, it's going to be too impersonal and, and challenging to navigate some of the things that come up to just have a, a phone or a video inter uh, interpreter present. But of course, with the onset of the pandemic, we had to rethink everything like everybody did. And so we wanted to come up with something where, you know, interpreters were initially looked at as one of the bigger risks of transmission because we're in all departments of the hospital all the time moving around. So one interpreter could potentially lead to a bad situation. 
Um, <clears throat> and yet we wanted to preserve that relationship that our interpreters have a chance to develop over time with clinicians and with their patients. Uh, and so what we did is we did this sort of hybrid modality where we got iPads, put them on stands. Uh, I've got one of them over here, but you can picture what I'm talking about. Uh, and had our interpreters sit in an office and sometimes from home and interpret via screen. And that helped a lot with eliminating the factor of quality control that you lose with the over the phone and much of the other agency-based remote interpreting services, um, as well as being able to preserve the, the rapport and the relationship and the, the communication channels that exist with somebody who's embedded within your institution. So to the extent that we can further develop that, um, there's some institutions that have done an amazing job of that as an entire institution. Stanford Medicine is one in particular that I would point folks to as a model. Um, I think it could make it so that even when we have to use modalities like video remote or phone, uh, we can substantially increase the quality of those and increase the trust between you and the person on the other end of the phone to be able to have those tough conversations around. I think you missed something or I'm missing this nuance. Well, that was the end of the questions. I encourage you, Matt, to take a look at the chat. You've got some shout outs there. People even sharing, I would say Tom Wilson said, this deepened my understanding of person-to-person -person communication, whether cross-linguistic, cross-cultural, cross-class, education, region. And that's what we were hoping to inspire today. So thank you so much, Matt, for presenting on this topic. Please you know, start a dialogue with Matt outside of this uh, presentation today. And don't forget to join us next week for the State of the IFAM address that Ron Ackerman will be providing. Adela is posting the link in the chat. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody.